officially get started. Welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you in class today. Today's class is looking at the First Amendment and we're gonna focus on the freedom of speech and the freedom of press. So my name is Kari Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center and I'll be here to help along the way. So if you have any questions, any thoughts you wanna share, please feel free to use that Q&A function or the chat function. We're here to help and we're here to have a conversation. So let's talk. Now we're here with one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, Tom Donnelly. So Tom, would you like to say hi to all the students? Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. Can't wait to dig into free speech and a free press. Now Tom, we have so much to go through uh, today with free speech. And you know, we look at this, this image of all these people with these signs and they're on a protest. But we really need to think about what is the big idea of the First Amendment before we jump into speech and press, but also how has the First Amendment been used as a tool by people over time in American history? I almost want to set the stage for the idea of what the First Amendment is to us as Americans, and then we can dive into how it's changed over time. Well, that sounds great, Curry. And yeah, let's, it's, it's such a powerful image there. And it's a reminder that you know, the, the First Amendment, like so many of our constitutional rights, the right to free speech and a free press, it's not automatic. It's not self-executing. People have had to fight for the right to speak freely throughout American history. And if we think back, you know, to the 1800s, that was abolitionists. That was anti-slavery folks. People who were fighting against slavery, their speech was banned in Southern states. Their, their speech was opposed even by Northern mobs. And so we may think of them as so clearly right, so clearly on the right side of history, but their speech was unpopular speech. And so they had to fight for that right to speak freely about things that we think are so fundamental to our constitution today. And fast forwarding a century later, we see the same thing in the civil rights movement, where what's more essential to advancing constitutional change than the right to march, the right to speak, the right to you know, uh, print, you know, print what you wanna say, the written word, assemble, all of those sorts of things. And again, we would see various states try to use state law to suppress that speech, to suppress those actions. And there finally in the 1960s, we would see the Supreme Court push back and get and move towards something closer to the free speech tradition that we have today. We're not there yet, obviously Curry will get there, but it's, a, it's such a, I, that image, it couldn't, I couldn't help but wax a little poetically about how powerful free speech and press are to constitutional change. But what's the big idea? What's the big take home about the freedom of speech today, it's that today the Supreme Court protects speech more fully, more robustly than at any point in American history. And that in the United States, free speech rights are the strongest free speech protections in the entire world. So, you know, in America, generally speaking, the government can't jail you, can't punish you, can't fine you for what you say, based on what you say and what you write. And that generally the court protects speech unless it's directed to and likely to cause immediate violence. So this is like, it's a very, very protective, speech protective rule. But at the same time, and this is an important thing to remember, the free, free speech rights, they're not absolute. So there are limited contexts where the government will, will talk about them, where the government can, restri can restrict speech rights. What's a classic example? When people have a certain relationship with the government. So this would be public school students and teachers are a classic example. We think that it's okay for the government to restrict speech in that context, to advance the mission of schools, the government's mission in schools, which is to educate students. It's not to say there are still free speech rights there, but they work differently than in the context outside of schools. But that's the big idea. I'll sort of pause there, Curry, and then be happy to go where, where you think makes sense. Well, and I, this is what I think is so fascinating about free speech in America, is that we almost started with like this idea that your speech is part of your brain and your ideas and who you are, so it can't be suppressed or controlled by government. So this question that we're gonna ask over time in America at different points in time, so colonial or founding period, and then we'll ask it again during like World War I, World War II, and then modern day. When and why can the government limit speech? But the reason why we put the word government in there is because we have to actually look really closely before we dive into those history stories, really closely at this amendment. Who? can make no law, Congress. So when we talk about schools in, you know, in a, about 10, 20 minutes, when we talk about schools and looking at Mary Beth Tinker or Hazelwood, schools, we're talking about public schools because they're controlled and connected to the government. So 
Tom, I turn it back to you with the First Amendment, kind of walk us through what this says, and then we'll dive into talking about Madison, because we got to start with Madison on this one. Absolutely. So yeah, there's the text, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Just a few things to flag about the text before we get to the history. So Curry's right, it says Congress, but the Supreme Court has long said that the amendment itself applies not just to Congress, but to the national, all parts of the national government initially. So the president, other government actors, so it sweeps more broadly than the text there says. The other thing is that it says no law, but the Supreme Court has never said that the right to free speech is absolute. And so we have long upheld laws that restrict speech in certain contexts. We already said public school students being one example, but think of laws against perjury. So if you're speaking inside a courtroom, we can tell you, you have to tell the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, we can punish that. And so there are many, there are examples like that mm -hmm. where there are limits on free speech rights in certain specific contexts. And the finally, final thing to note there is the words freedom of, of freedom of speech and of the press. So what, what does that cover? Well, it covers more than just speaking and writing, printing, talking. It covers new technologies. So movies, television, the internet. It covers symbolic expression. So the right to wave a flag or even to burn a flag or to wear an armband, which we'll talk, that, talk to when we talk about when we get to Tinker. Um, uh, so, so there it's, it sweeps more broad, it sweeps, uh, you know, fairly broadly in that sense. And then finally, what isn't covered? Well, Curry already suggested it. So the First Amendment's covering uh, actions of the government. It doesn't cover the actions of private actors. So private employers, private universities, private schools. And so it's really, really strong where it applies, but it's, it's important to realize that it's applying to government actions. And then finally, and I, oh, I'm sorry, Curry. Yeah, yes. I was gonna say just with private, like I know we've been talking about it a lot and the students have seen it too, like Twitter, Facebook, social media, they're private companies too. So what can be and cannot be restricted on there? That gets really tricky too when it's a government actor on social media. That's where my brain starts to be like, wait, how does this work? <laughs> yeah, and those remain really contested questions in constitutional law. But the, the thing to really keep in mind, the last bottom line before we get to Madison, is that in America, the general rule, it's really, really protective of free speech. And today we protected speech more, more uh, strongly than we ever have in our history. And we have the strongest free speech protections in the world. Why do we have them? Because we don't trust the government to tell us which ideas are okay to say and not okay to say, what things are okay to speak and what things aren't okay to speak. We think that it's best in a government governed by we the people for us to be able to speak a wide range of ideas, a wide range of views, many ideas that anger us, that, that, that sometimes we think are so wrong, are really, really hurtful, but we still protect them generally in, in the interests of broader public debate and in the idea of making our republic work. Um, so I'll sort of leave it there, Curry. Um, yeah, we, so the founders came into this, though, with lived experiences. We always talk about, like, you know, students come into class and they have lives and they have experiences. So when we think of the founders and Madison and um, Washington and Ben Franklin, they're coming into this with experiences where they couldn't speak out against their government and feeling like their voices could not be heard to fix or change the government. So when we think about things that are being protected, and we'll get through this in the class, there's certain types of speech that, like you said earlier, that are more protected or more precious, is what I always say, more precious than others. Um, we can jump into Madison, or do you wanna do mind your privileges? <laughs> sure, I mean, so when, when we're thinking about the First Amendment and what does Madison have in mind when he's you know, writing the draft of the First Amendment, what does the founding generation have in mind? There are two really big examples I would think you could flag. One is this example of William Penn. So William Penn, you know, famous Quaker, founder of Pennsylvania. But the, 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 uh, the controversy here is that he lit, at this point, it's before he comes to the United States, before he comes to America, the American shores. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in the late 1600s. And he lives in England. And England has an established church, the Church of England. But William Penn is a Quaker. And so it's illegal in England for there to be religious assemblies of over five people. William Penn has a Quaker meeting anyway. And he's arrested. And he's tried, he's tried under this law for violating English law and the jury decides not to convict him. The jury says, you know, basically this law is unjust and this famous quote is William Penn as, as the judge is trying to um, uh, get the jury to decide otherwise, Penn cries out, you are Englishmen, mind your privileges, give not away your right. And so this is a powerful image of, of speech, assembly, religious liberty, all of those things we see enshrined in the first amendment 
and its protection of freedom of conscience. The other famous example is the case of John, uh, John Peter Zenger, which is again, in the, it's in the uh, 1730s. And who's Zenger? He's a printer in New York. And to, to, he basically, he publishes criticisms of the governor of New York. And he's tried for seditious libel. He's tried for criticizing the governor of New York. And under New York law, he, he, he has violated the law, but the jury again decides, no, 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 that law is unjust. And, you know, in the end, it, it's what we call jury nullification. It's the jury uh, going with what they think is a just result rather than the written, uh, the written law in the books. But what, this, what these two episodes teach us is that when we're putting together a bill of rights after the ratification of the Constitution, that founding generation, we want to be able to protect dissenters like Penn and people like Zenger, publishers who were there to criticize the government. Those are the sorts of things that we're looking to enshrine in the First Amendment. Should we go to the first? Should we go to the uh, Alien and Sedition Act, Curry? Absolutely. But I think it, it's so important that, again, the jury said, in our instincts as people, you are allowed to criticize your government. That is something we believe in. Because, it, But what I love about this story and the Mind the Privilege and Zanger, it's the people pushing back that then gets the, the founding fathers so excited about making sure that that First Amendment is in the Constitution. So flash forward, 1798, the First Amendment is in the Constitution at this point in time. And um, Adams, Adams has a few things to change about the First Amendment, one might say. Well, yeah, so one of the big early controversies in, uh, it, it, under the new Constitution is over the Alien and Sedition Act. So this is a story that involves some, a trio of famous founders. It's got John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, both of whom you see on the screen, James Madison. And so what's the controversy? Well, it's, it, it, the, it, the Adams administration and the Federalist Con Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798. And so here it's, it's shortly after the ratification of the Constitution, the ratification of the Bill of Rights. And, uh, you know, in the end, we look back at these as acts that attack the core of free speech as we know it today, which is the right to criticize the government. And so the Alien and Sedition Acts, to boil it down, it's, this, this graphic does a great job, but it says... We're going to punish you if you criticize Federalist President John Adams, but it's okay to criticize uh, uh, his political opponent, the Vice President Thomas Jefferson. And so, why would they have laws like this in place? What you know, looking back, we'd say what could be more obviously violating the First Amendment than this? Well, it's a time of, of high partisan passion. So we're seeing the rise of political parties. We're seeing the rise of a partisan press. So press affiliated with each of those parties. We're seeing nasty political debates, and we're seeing a really, really important global crisis. We see two of the major powers of the world, Great Britain and revolutionary France at war, and Americans themselves are being uh, uh, drawn into these debates with the Jeffersonians taking the side of the revolutionary French and the, and, and the Federalists taking the side of Great Britain. And so it's a time of great partisan passions. And so the Adams administration passes the Alien and Sedition Acts to effectively try to keep public debate under wraps, to try to, to try to, but in the end, what you're doing is uh, you're making it illegal to criticize the national government, to criticize the Federalist president. But Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, they fight back. They author these really, these famous things called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. And these are the Madisonian and Jeffersonian responses to the Alien and Sedition Acts. And what they argue is these acts are clearly unconstitutional. So what's, the, what's the, the, the main violation here? Well, this is, a, this is a great quote from Madison here. The Sedition Act ought to produce universal alarm because it is leveled against the right of freely examining public characters and measures and of free communications among the people thereon, which has ever been justly deemed the only effectual guardian of every other right. And so what Madison's saying here is that free speech, the ability to criticize the government is at the absolute core of the American Republic. What could be more important for uh, a vision where we're going to reason together, where we're going to debate, where we're going to be able to, where we want to be able to pursue the common good, then an ability to say when we think the national government got it wrong, the answer is not to jail the political opposition. The answer is to to debate, to debate. And so uh, Madison and Jefferson here are saying that if you permit things like the Alien and Sedition Acts, you 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 risk just destroying the republic. And remember. This is very shortly after the ratification of the Constitution. Everything is so, so very fragile. And so what Jefferson and Madison are trying to do is to try to place us on a strong constitutional foundation. And the last thing about this story, Curry, it's amazing. This is not a controversy, a constitutional controversy that's decided by the Supreme Court. 
we have the election of 1800. Jefferson defeats John Adams. Jefferson and his administration let these acts expire. And Jefferson himself uses his pardon power to pardon those punished under the Alien and Sedition Acts. And so it's something that ends up settled in public debate and by elections. And so it's a sense of where sometimes, you know, we'll get to plenty of cases where the Supreme Court plays a key role in pushing free speech, especially for political minorities. Uh, but also politics and elections can also be important for protecting constitutional rights. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that it's in the Constitution as like a big C, but how it plays out isn't very clear. And we see that, you know, we see the, the people's will changing the tide during this case. But then after that, and we can jump to the abolitionist movement and we can look at abolitionist movement, we can look at World War I and World War II and show how it really didn't fully adjust it until what, the 1940s really? Like much, much later. Yeah, I mean, and that's, this, this surprised me. Uh, you know, I went to law school thinking I knew something about free speech and it shocked me that the First Amendment as we think it today, uh, the really where we strongly protect free speech rights, it didn't exist, I would say, until the 1960s. It's really, really, really late in the day. And so we're reminded by that with the Alien and Sedition Acts controversy we just talked about. We're reminded of that with the suppression of abolitionist and anti-slavery speech before the Civil War. And so this is, again, this is, these are laws in the South that are passed that ban anti-slavery and abolitionist speech. These are laws that ban teaching enslaved people to read. So these are, these are like, these are laws on the books in Southern states that exist. But if you go back to the, 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 other, the other image, Curry, it's also important to remember that it's not just laws on the books, but it's also mob violence against mm -hmm. abolitionist printers. And this is mob violence, it's not just in, it's not in the South, this is happening in Illinois. So that, so, you it know, happened in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And so this is where, you know, again, it's, it's easy to always think, you know, of course the anti-slavery and abolitionist folks are on the right side of history, but their speech was the unpopular speech. Their speech was the dangerous speech. Their speech was a speech that was gonna destroy the Republic. And so both the government and many people acted against them. And so it took ongoing courage, ongoing arguments, you know, ongoing debates and to, to shift public opinion over time. And obviously, ultimately a civil war, a civil war. And then we would write new protections into the constitution after that with the 14th amendment, which one of the most important things the 14th amendment does both through the text of the constitution and through later Supreme court decisions is to take the bill of rights, including the first amendment and say, you know, at the founding, it may have just applied to the national government, but with the 14th amendment, it's also going to apply to the states. And so it universalized throughout the United States protections for free speech. So you can criticize the president, the vice president, but you can criticize your governor or your state legislature. And all of that is now protected by the US Constitution after the 14th Amendment. But shall we go to World War I to once again yeah, remind ourselves say, that like, it takes a I, long time for it to actually did. work? I know, and I think it's so fascinating that like what we think of as free speech today is very closely aligned with what Madison thought of free speech. But in between there, we weren't there as a country. So again, I think the big key takeaway from the abolitionist movement is, when we think about the uh, First Amendment today, and we have a great video of Justice Kagan sharing this, it's speech we don't like that we're protecting. It's speech that we think is, is horrible or gross, but that's not always the case in history. And so it's the speech that maybe wasn't liked at that time. And so you're protecting it to really kind of be able to make sure ideas can bubble up. And we'll get into that next after the World War I story. When do we start to pivot and change? Because during World War I, we're still not there. And this is 1930s, just to give our students a frame of reference of time. We're still jailing people for saying that very light things about the war and saying that it's not right. I, and I, um, we're, I know we're gonna talk about Whitney as well. She was speaking out against lynching when she was arrested during that speech um, that she was arrested for. It was, she was on a speech about lynching. Um, it was connected to um, speaking out against the government, but that was the topic. And I always think that's crazy that somebody saying lynching is bad was something that you could be suppressing speech for. Okay, Tom, walk us through real quickly. Yeah, of course. So it's, it's World War I. So these cases here, they're during World War I. So they're in the 19 teens and then even into the 1920s when we have concerns about the communists. And so what happens here? Well, what we often see throughout American history is that 
the, the national government states they really look to, to, to limit speech in times of national crisis. So especially in times of war. And so like the Adams administration, Woodrow Wilson and his administration, they passed new laws that attack the core of free speech. In their case, they're attacking speech that's criticizing World War I. So they're going after pacifists, socialists, other anti-war activists. And so Congress passes an Espionage Act of, of 1917, which is meant to limit, it's meant to, to ban information, uh, communicating information that's gonna undermine the war effort. And they pass their own Sedition Act. What do they model it after? The 1798 Sedition Act. They're modeling it after what the Adams administration did. And so this, this act imposes harsh penalties for all sorts of dissenting speech, speech insulting the government, the constitution, the flag, the military. And the Wilson administration, these aren't just words on a page. They believe them and they use them. They think it's absolutely essential that if America is going to help win World War I, we have to make sure that this anti-war speech doesn't get out, that it doesn't undermine the war effort. And so the Wilson administration, they prosecute thousands of people under these acts, people going to prison again, in many cases, for simply criticizing the war. And what's the classic, who's the classic example, Curry? It's Eugene V. Debs. So he's prosecuted under the Sedition Act. Who is he? He's sort of the Bernie Sanders of his time. He's a labor, or, you know, pacifist labor organizer, organizer of the international workers of the world. He runs for president when in 1900, 1904, 1908, 1912 as a socialist. And in this case, it's June uh, 1918, and he gives an anti-war speech. And he's prosecuted. He's prosecuted under the Sedition Act. He's convicted, and he's sentenced to 10 years in prison. 10 years. What happens when it gets to the Supreme Court? A unanimous Supreme Court says that conviction is okay. It's constitutional. This is consistent with the First Amendment. And this calls to mind also probably the most, fit. what's the most famous case during this period? Schenck versus United States, which is in 1919. And this is, you know, who, who is Schenck? Schenck is someone who's circulating pamphlets saying the draft is unconstitutional. It violates the 13th Amendment's ban on slavery. It's unconstitutional. We shouldn't go along with the draft. He's prosecuted under the Espionage Act. And again, writing for unanimous court, just as Oliver Wendell Holmes upholds the conviction, says that this conviction under the Espionage Act is constitutional. And what do we get from Schenck? We get the, the court's famous clear and present danger test. So that here, here's the language. So what Holmes says is that when there's a free speech challenge, the court has to ask the following questions. Were the, were, the, were the words used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent? And what's the famous line from Schenck? Here it is. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. So here, what Schenck is emphasizing is what Holmes is emphasizing in Schenck. First Amendment rights, they're not absolute. And even things like the Wilson administration going after people like Debs, people like Schenck, in the interests of making sure America helps win World War I, that is constitutional. So this is really, this is very different. To, to telegraph this, this is a huge point. This is not how we do it today. This is not how free speech in the First Amendment works today. But this is going into the 20th century. This is still what the Supreme Court is doing. And it would take Oliver Wendell Holmes changing his mind he becomes a great defender of free speech. Of course, he wrote Debs, he wrote Schenck, he wrote this limited conception of free speech, but he changes his mind. And he's joined by his colleague, Justice Louis Brandeis, and their dissents during this period in the 1910s and 1920s transform what people think about free speech. But remember, these are dissents. They're not writing the majority opinion of the court. And it wouldn't be until the 1960s, the 1960s, where we really have a free speech protective majority on the Supreme Court. Two things really quickly. Number one, read the dissents. The, these, and we'll send them out to you. But in any course case, read the dissents. Because sometimes they can lay, like when we talked about slavery and the Dred Scott case, they lay groundwork in the, the legal documents for a different opinion. What I love about the Oliver Wendell Holmes story, it's actually his teacher that kind of like nags him over the summer that is basically like, I think you got this wrong. I don't think this is the way this is supposed to work and kind of like just pokes at his brain and says, think about this in other ways, think about this this way. And it was that kind of influence as a teacher that really made him kind of rethink his understanding of speech. So they have, Tom, they have two very different ways that they say free speech is good.
or free expression, free ideas is good. Can you kind of lay out the Holmes way and the Brandeis way, which it always, I love that they're like friends in this, but they come at it in totally different angles. Yeah, they're both constitutional prophets. They're both so central to what we think of free speech, but they're such different, different, different people. So who's Oliver Wendell Holmes? Oliver Wendell Holmes, he fought in the Civil War. He almost died at Antietam. He himself, as a result of that, had kind of a fatalistic, nihilistic view of the world. He wasn't optimistic about the average person or about American democracy. But nevertheless, he had a theory. His, his, his worldview led to a certain theory of free speech. We think of it as the marketplace of ideas theory. And so here's the, here's the key quote. The best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. So Holmes here is saying, he's not saying everything's gonna be okay if we all reason together. He had a much darker view of humanity than that. But what he is saying is, I don't know what truth is. I also know that the government doesn't know what truth is. I know that over time, we've gotten a ton of things wrong. Probably the best that we can do is make sure that the government doesn't make bad choices restricting speech, allow as many ideas as possible to be out there in the marketplace of ideas. And certain ideas are gonna win out and certain ideas aren't. But in the end, fundamentally, I don't trust the government to be the one regulating what gets to be said. So this is the marketplace theory of ideas. That's how Holmes, that's the closest Holmes thinks we can get to truth. It's based in uh, really a deep humility, the humility about from both himself, he was a very arrogant man in many ways, but he also knew that even smart people got things wrong, um, but that the best we could do as a result of that is to maximize freedom and allow as many ideas to blossom. Whereas Louis Brandeis is just a deep believer in the American Republic, in deliberation, in reason, you know, you know he, he wanted us to reason together, to say, to, to express as many ideas as possible. And because of that, by doing that, we would promote the common good. And here's the key quote. This is from Whitney versus California. And I urge you for Jeff work, if you're gonna choose anything, read Brandeis's Whitney concurrence. This is Whitney versus California, 1927. It's short, but my teacher, Robert Post said, it's the greatest opinion in the history of the Supreme Court. And so here's what, here's what Brandeis said, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. So if there's bad ideas out there, what's the best remedy? Express good ones. And if we allow that, if we keep the government out of it, we as citizens will reason together and build a better society. So there's optimism in Brandeis about American democracy, the American Republic, whereas Holmes is much more cynical, but both of them, it leads them to the same thing. They, neither of the, one of them wanna trust the government to regulate debates. And as long as we have time to discuss, as long as we have time to reason together, keep the government out and allow freedom of speech. And I think this is huge. I always say like Holmes come at it, it comes at it like a capitalist. Like, yes. like let's- He was a social Darwinist, yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and Brandeis comes at it as like, almost like a hippie, like kumbaya, yeah, we'll do it together. But they come at the same point. And I think that's really, I love this story because they show us that how you get there may be very different, but that you lay out the idea that this is something we believe in, that these ideas need to flourish, even if they're ideas we don't agree with. Now we have to wrap up in a few minutes, but I wanted to fast forward to school. And I'm going to like, zoop, let's jump to 1969. And let's look at a time, place, manner kind of idea around First Amendment and speech. Where you say it, how you say it, when you say it, what you say, all matters. And when you're talking about, is it protected or is it not? And that's what we kind of group around. There can be time restriction, there can be place restrictions, um, and there could be types of speech restriction. When we look at um, the Tinker case, this is Mary Beth and John Tinker, they're teenagers um, during Vietnam War, their speech is in a public school. It's not verbal. They're wearing armbands and you can see the armband there. So kind of like wrap us around what happens here. And it really does change the way we see before this, it was questionable if we had, you know, bill of rights in schools, but this case really set some groundwork that yes, there can be restrictions, but students aren't just shut down and have no rights. Students have rights too, even when they're in school. Um, but there's a balance. There's always a balance with this. So walk us through this one really quickly, and then we'll yeah. wrap up on public and private schools. <laughs> yeah, no, you're exactly right. So Curry, again, what the Supreme Court does in the 1960s is it takes the side of Holmes, Brandeis, Jefferson, Madison, 
And it writes that test in Brandenburg versus Ohio, which says, you know, the government can only regulate speech generally if it's directed to and likely to cause immediate violence. So that's the general rule. But you're right, there are contexts where the government can restrict speech. They're all, you know, a lot of them, we think of them as time, place, and manner regulations. You know, the easiest example is, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, stay, stand outside an apartment building with a bullhorn at two o'clock in the morning. Like, it doesn't matter what you're saying, we're not regulating it because of what you're saying, we just want people to be able to sleep. And so that, you know, there's that, that, that sort of idea. Um, but also we see different rules in the schools. And so with Tinker, we sort of get two big ideas. So Tinker v. Des Moines, this is the Vietnam War. These are students wearing these armbands that you see in the picture there, protesting the war, the school punishes them. And the question is, you know, will they prevail under the First Amendment free speech? And what the court says, the court says two things. One of them is answering the question you, you framed at the beginning, Curry, which is, you know, the question is, does the First Amendment free speech, does it apply in the schools? And the court says, yes. Just as Abe Fortas in a seven to two decision, here's the famous quote. It can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. And so in this case, Mary Beth, John Tinker, they win, they win. And so the school, you know, what was the school's argument? The school's argument was, well, if you bring that politics into the school, it's gonna create disruption. It's gonna disrupt what's going on here. But in fact, there was no disruption. And what the court said was, you know, just fearing that disruption isn't enough when it's a personal expression like this of the students. For the school to be able to restrict speech, there has to be um, a likelihood of a material or substantially, it has to materially or substantially interfere with the school's operations. And so the idea here is that students generally have free speech rights. The school can regulate those rights if, they're acti if the student's activity materially or, materially or substantially interferes with the school's operations. And again, to wrap your head around it, don't, don't focus on those words so much. It's like, what, what's going on here? The court's saying that if the activity really, really does interfere with the educational mission of the school, really does disrupt what's going on in the classroom, really does contradict some core educational mission, the school could regulate speech. So students have free speech rights, but they're different in public schools than they are outside of that and more generally in society. Um, that's Tinker. What the courts did after that was it clarified what it meant, what it meant in, in, in its Tinker test. And the classic example here is a case called Hazelwood School District versus Colmare in 1988. And what the court, this is a case in Hazelwood, Missouri. There are two articles going into a student newspaper covering divorce and teenage pregnancy, and the principal censors them. Principal says, nope, can't have those articles. And the Supreme Court says in a five to three decision, that's constitutional. A principal can do that. A principal can censor it. So long as the censorship is quote, reasonably related to a legitimate pedagogical concern. And what's going on here is the court setting some, some further limits on speech inside public schools. And what the court's saying is, you know, it's one thing for Mary Beth and John Tinker to, to on themselves put an armband on. It's another thing for people to write something in a school publication. And I think the way that the court said it was, you know, that, that you know, in a school newspaper, it has the imprimatur of the school. It has the stamp of approval from the school and it's communicating something from the perspective, you know, it's, it's then wrapped into the a communicative act of the school. Here's what the court said, a school need not tolerate student speech that is inconsistent with its basic educational mission, even though the government could not censor similar speech outside of the school. So Hazelwood, again, setting up different rules inside public schools than you would find outside. So there are rights, but they're more limited. And I, so we, a few weeks ago, we had Ju Judge Rendell, who's at the third district court. She explained it once, like there's special settings. And so there's more control that the government has on special settings. And, you know, use examples, schools are one of them, public schools and jails are one of them too. Mm -hmm. So it was military an interesting bases. way to, yeah, military bases, sorry. I always like do the two, like schools and jails and I don't want the students to think schools are jails. Uh, but <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I think is really interesting is now that schools, so many schools are online. And again, this is a public school. I just want to say that again, um, this was in school. How does this all change now that we're all in Zoom schools together? Um, and how does this change when something that happens on a social media account can disrupt school? There are cases right now going through the lower courts on this. So that's why I like to end with this one because it isn't figured out yet. And we're trying to balance this. Um, and, you know, we go back to Brandeis talking about slow deliberation around this. How does social media affect the outcomes of some of these cases too and the change in our platform? So, I leave you with all that just to ponder and to remember that the Constitution is 
is constantly a moving target and we're constantly following it and you should too. So where is it, where do, where do we go back to our values and then how do they work with the technology today? That's right. And I mean, the, the court has been reluctant over time to take school speech cases, but you're right. There are so many lower court cases going on right now that are, you know, what, when students speak on social media and it influences what happens inside a school, what do we do with that? What sort of rules apply? Is it what you see with the typical free speech rules in the classroom? Is it just what, you know, the general rules are outside the classroom? The courts disagree about this. And I, I really can't even wager a prediction as to how the Supreme Court will decide that it's really, really hard stuff. And because it's, it's, it's even, Curry, you're right. I mean, it's like, there are these settings like schools, jails, military bases, courtrooms, where we restrict speech. But because of our free speech tradition, I think that there's, there's always a friction between the general rules and what we're doing in those settings and figuring out how we, how we strike the right balance between a commitment to robust speech, which we see in public discourse, versus the need to really restrict it in certain contexts to promote a clear governmental mission. It's really, really hard. Really, really hard. So. Uh, we'll stay on top of it. And again, the Constitution matters in your life all the time. So it's great to see like the relevance of something that was written 230 plus years ago and how we're uh, looking at it today. So Tom, thank you so much. It was a great class on speech today. Everybody, I put a whole bunch of resources in the chat box to so check them out, but we will do a wrap up email at the end of the week with all of them in there as well. And we did record everything. Thank you, Anna. Um, Thanks, Anna. Adding a whole bunch in there around World War I. But David French, if you're free at one o'clock on Friday, we have a constitutional scholar gonna join us as our, one of our guests. And it should be an interesting way to look at free speech in America and probably college campuses. I feel like he's gonna go there. So what okay. is college like? You know, cause I think that's even more confusing when you get the college campuses. It's somewhere in between a public school setting and um, the, the real world. Yeah, no, a lot of flashpoints on college campuses for sure. Yeah, hot topic. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording now.